This screencast will examine educational patterns according to gender. Before 1991, boys were out doing girls at GCSE, A level and degree level. There are also clear differences in subject choices. Now, girls achieve higher than boys at all levels. These differences are equalised when both sexes undertake degree level study. So the screencast will examine why girls underachieved before 1991, why they now do better, why boys are underachieving and reasons for differences in subject choice. The feminist argument is also important here, as many feminists argue that girls are let down by the subjects that they choose to study at GCSE, A level and beyond. So we're going to start off by looking at past explanations for why girls underachieved. Norman argued that early socialisation accounted for any failure of girls. Norman pointed out that before children start school, conditioning and sex stereotyping have already begun. Girls and boys are encouraged to play with toys according to gender. This develops a set of attitudes and aptitudes. Girls may have their educational aspirations affected through playing with dolls and other toys which re reinforce the stereotype of women as carers. Boys tend to be more active than girls and this may be reflected in their attitudes in classrooms. Furthermore, boys are more likely to be given constructional toys which can help develop scientific and mathematical concepts. Stereotypes of men and women can be further reinforced by the media through comics, books, television and various types of advertising. However, Douglas argued that cultural factors to do with socialisation were actually less in more important than material factors. J.W.B. Douglas argued that in some families, more resources are devoted to the education of sons than daughters. If parents believe their son's future depends more upon his work than their daughters, they may be less w willing to finance post-compulsory education for daughters than for their sons. However, this is fairly under-researched and it is questionable whether such differences continue today. Other explanations have actually looked at factors in school and how this affected the previous underachievement of girls. So Lobben looked at early years reading schemes and she found from a study of 179 stories only 35 stories had heroines compared to 71 which had heroes. Girls and women were almost exclusively portrayed in traditional domestic roles and it was nearly always men and women who took the lead in non-domestic ta tasks. In at least three of the schemes females took the lead in only three activities in which both sexes were involved, hopping, shopping with parents and skipping. Males took the lead in seven joint activities, exploring, climbing trees, building things, looking after pets, sailing boats, flying kites and washing cars. Lobben's research was conducted in the 1970s, but more recent research has shown that sex stereotyping con continued into the 90s. In 1992, Leslie Best examined a sample of 132 books for preschool aged children in an attempt to discover whether gender bias in children's books has decreased. She found in 132 books, 792 males and 356 female characters were portrayed. There were 94 male heroes but just 44 heroines. Some 75% of the female characters featured in the book were portrayed in family situations compared to just 15% of the male characters. Men were shown in 69 occupations, but women were only shown in 18. There have been many efforts 
to get rid of gender stereotyping today. But there is evidence that sometimes these efforts have not been completely successful. John Abrahams looked at a study in 1996. He found that gender stereotyping continued. He looked at three main math books and he found them to be extremely male dominated. There were many more males represented in active roles. Women tended to be shopping for food or buying washing machines, whilst men tended to be running businesses or investing. Stanworth looked at the later stages of the education system in a study of A-level classes at a further education college. She used interviews rather than observations, and this is problematic as she relied on students' memory rather than seeing for herself. There may have been many ethical reasons why she chose to do interviews, and in 1983 it may have been more difficult to observe teachers in classrooms. She interviewed teachers and pupils from seven different classes in the humanities department. She found that teachers displayed attitudes which actually obstructed the educational progress of girls. These attitudes weren't just confined to male teachers, they were also typical of female teachers. Teachers found it more difficult to remember the girls in their classes. All the pupils who teachers said it was difficult to name and recall were girls. Quiet boys were remembered, but quiet girls seemed to blend into the background and make little impression on their teachers. Stanworth found that teachers held stereotypical views of what their female pupils would be doing in the future. Only one girl was seen as having the potential to enter professional occupation. Interestingly, she was the most assertive of the girls in the classroom, but she wasn't academically able. The most ap academically successful girl was described by one teacher as being likely to become a personal ass assistant for somebody rather important. Even for this girl, marriage was suggested as one of the most significant aspects of her future life, and male teachers mentioned nothing other than marriage as the future for two-thirds of the female pupils. When asked which students were given the most attention by teachers, the pupils themselves named boys two and a half times as often as girls. The pupils reported that boys were four times more likely to join in classroom discussions, twice as likely to seek help from the teacher, and twice as likely to be asked questions. As you can see, interviews do not always give us the correct statistics and there's a clear issue with validity here. Perhaps observations would have been a better way to study this. Stanworth also found that girls were likely to underestimate their ability while boys often overestimated theirs. They were asked to rank themselves in terms of ability in each class. In 19 of the 24 cases in which teachers and pupils disagreed about their ranking, all of the girls placed themselves lower than the teachers' estimates, and all but one boy placed themselves higher. In conclusion, Stanworth found that interaction in the classroom disadvantaged girls considerably. They were encouraged to take less part in classes and got less attention from the teachers, and as a consequence, lacked faith in their own ability. Spender is another feminist sociologist who focuses on attention and interactions in the classroom. She went a bit further than Stanworth in that she actually conducted observations, but her observations were of herself rather than others. So again, the research is flawed. It is probably because it was more difficult to access classrooms in the 1980s when classrooms were a teacher's domain. This was before the days of Ofsted and before the days when teachers were constantly monitored and observed. Spender argued that education is controlled by men who use their power to define men's knowledge and experiences as important and they see women's knowledge as insignificant. A, a good example of this might be Ada Lovelace. The contribution to human progress by Ada Lovelace is largely ignored. She was key in developing computer software. 
Spender argues that the whole curriculum is riddled with sex sexism. Indeed, she argues that it is androcentric. It concentrates on men. Quoting from a variety of studies, Spender says that girls get less attention from boys in the classroom. She takes her own classes where she consciously tried to divide her time equally between the sexes. Yet despite this, only 38% of her time was spent interacting with girls. Spender argued that girls have to wait longer than boys for what attention they do receive in the classroom, and that female contributions to, to discussion and debate are usually treated dismissively by males present. Boys are often abusive, insulting to girls, yet teachers fail to sanction them for this. Male pupils play an important part in damaging girls' education. Spender claims boys do not like girls. They find them inferior and unworthy and even despicable. Boys communicate their low regard for the girls in the classroom, forcing them to retreat into keeping a low profile. However, Spender does not just accuse the education system for the reasons why girls underachieve. She argues that girls are aware of the roles that they're supposed to play long before they get into the education system. She sees male dominance in society as a whole as the basic cause of girls' difficulties in education, but school, schools reinforce that dominance and ensure that it continues. To criticise Stanley and Spender then, we might look at Jane and Peter Finch. We cannot take studies at face value. Studies which just look at the amount of interaction between boys and girls in the classroom might ignore the fact that sometimes a few students are dominating classroom interaction. So Jane and Peter Finch studied a class of 10 to 11 year olds. They found that it was three particular boys who received the most attention and in actual fact the rest of the boys received no more attention than the girls. Other criticisms might look at the methodology that Stanworth and Spender used. Obviously, using interviews rather than observations is a massive problem because it relies on the memory of students and teachers and often that memory can be distorted. Also, the fact that Spender actually observed her own lessons is again flawed because clearly she knew what she was looking for and that would have affected what she recorded. So now we are actually going to have a look at why girls are now doing better than boys. So as you can see from this graph here, the boys are the aqua colour and the girls are the dark blue. So this is looking at the first year of GCSE when girls overtook boys. And from 1991, they also overtook boys in terms of A-level. So in 1985, there wasn't a huge difference. 26% of males achieved 5 A to C's or equivalent compared to 27% of females. And we can see that difference getting bigger. And in 2006 to 2007... 56% of boys achieve 5A to C's or equivalent compared to 66% of girls. So a 10% gap at GCSE. That is clearly significant. When students start school, they're given baseline assessments. A national survey of 6,953 children by the QCA found that girls scored higher in all tests. 62% of girls could concentrate without supervision for 10 minutes, but only 49% of boys could do this. 56% of girls could write their own name and spell it correctly. Only 42% of boys could do this. According to a DFES study in 2007, 70% of children with identified special educational needs are boys. At key stages 1 to 3, girls do consistently better than boys especially in English, where the gender gap gets bigger with age. In science and maths, the gap isn't as big, but girls still do better than boys. 